as Matt told us, uh, uh, Mark told you, uh, my name is Tim Jones, otherwise known as Wayne Master 53, the portal handle that is stuck with me by military days. Um, we'll talk about this here in a little while, making sure the question to those. I'm a Christian father, husband, and veteran in that order, which is why I'm no longer active duty. All right, for those of you that are active duty know that I definitely take a goal on family. I'm a senior security consultant and developer, part-time developer for Black Hills Information Security, specializing in web application security. It's on their main web apps that are going. I also do some SANS instruction uh, with Security 542, which is SANS Web Application Penetration Testing Course, for those of you that are familiar with the SANS Institute. Do some security blogging. Uh, my blog site is message53.com. I also kind of do some moonlighting over there at call.com. Uh, every once in a while, you see all my stuff over there. And I consider myself a coder. Now, I'm a programmer. I'm not sure I'm a good programmer, but I can listen to some Python, so I consider myself a coder. Before we even get started on anything else, I want to give some, some shout outs to some folks. Uh, I don't know that any of these folks are here. Raise your hand if you are. I'd like to know. Um, yeah, I don't see any of these folks. Basically, what we're talking about today is a framework. Uh, a framework that's modular, and in that case, the framework is really good as the module that you have for it. And even though I'm the sole developer of the framework itself, all of these folks are responsible for about 80% of the modules that actually make the tool useful. All right. The only guy that's actually contributed to the framework itself is Ethan Rovich, he's a co-worker of mine. But the rest of these folks in order have, have contributed anywhere from about 15 to 20 modules to the modules. So these guys, uh, the tool would not be functional, would not be useful without those folks, but I definitely want to give them a shout out. So reconnaissance. Reconnaissance is an important part of our methodology, whether we're doing network penetration testing or whether we're doing web application penetration. Um, it can also be important if we're just doing social engineering work, right? things like that. But in either case, it's the first step within those methodologies. So we should be executing reconnaissance during any either type of those tests. So what does what is reconnaissance defined? Well, Marion Webster defines it as a preliminary survey to gain information. Okay, that's a pretty general definition. I think from a penetration testing perspective, we can expand that to say that we're using open resources, open sources of information, and without making direct contact with our target. Right? That's very, very key. This lack of direct contact is something we're going to touch on. Traditionally, the way that we've done reconnaissance and penetration tests has followed kind of this platform here. These are the types of actions that we've taken, right? Selection, verification. Verification is the most important thing of our targets. That can be both systems and people. So how many people here do penetration testing? You scope your own gauge by any chance? Right. Well, those of you that do penetration testing or know anything about it, uh, when you are scoping an engagement, somebody gives you a list of IP addresses that's your target, you validate that those are legitimately their, their IP addresses. Uh, we've been on tests for folks and we said, hey, we, we need your range before we can start our scoping the engagement. They come back to us, give us a list of IP addresses. We go do some research only to find out that those IP, some of those IP addresses don't even belong to Real life story, we're working out on the Vegas Strip doing some work. We gain access to an uh, administrative console on an appliance, and the host name has nothing to do with the company. In fact, it has to do with the competitor. So we go back to our client and say, hey, uh, we're, we've got access to a box, and the prompt here has the host name of uh, so-and-so, so-and-so. Uh, I thought you said this is your IP space. And they come back to us and say, no, no, our IPs are on that space. We don't necessarily own the whole space. So it's incredibly <laughs> important. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of stuff happens. Right? So it's incredibly important that we verify that the IP addresses that we're given actually belong to our client. On the flip side of that, are they giving us everything that they, that they own? Right? So we can do some reconnaissance to actually validate that they've given us their entire space. Because the guy that you're talking to, your point of contact when you're scoping these engagements, he's just a third, he's just a middleman, right? He's going to the network engineers to ask these questions. He doesn't know if the information he's giving you is, is, is gospel or not. So you've got to go and you've got to validate this stuff. So that's kind of one of the first things we do. We're also looking for lists of users, employees, and organizational information. This can be used for social engineering. This can be used for capital reset stuff. We want to have to analyze any trust relationships that we may be able to leverage further along in the process. We want to look for information about technologies, the possibly configurations of those technologies. You can find stuff like that on news groups, in resumes, things of that sort. Code snippets, that's another place we find news groups. How many of you guys develop code? Now, I'm not talking about like programmer level, just throw together scripts and stuff like that. How often do you go out to a website and cut and paste? I mean, there are just a ton of code out there. You would not believe how many internal developers will go to some news group somewhere, post a bunch of code that's going to be going into a production application saying, 
So like I've got this security scanner, and it's throwing SQL injection stuff at me, and I don't know how to fix it, when you help me? And then you see that code, it belongs to the target that you're assessing, but you can <laughs> take and find my vulnerabilities in a bunch of applications. I wouldn't be saying it if it hasn't happened, all right? It happens. So things like that we can find. And obviously, we can, also we can find a weakness in physical security. So this is kind of what traditional recon has been made of. But there's a problem. Right? It takes time. Uh, the single most, the single most restriction that we have to penetration testers this time. The real threat has a lot more time than we got. People are only willing to pay for somewhere between the neighborhood of five to ten days of testing and a few days of reporting. So we don't have a lot of time. Therefore, penetration testers start cutting stuff out. And in most cases, the excuses I hear from internal folks are, I already know everything about my network. All right, we'll talk about that here in a second. External penetration testers like myself, we just don't have enough time to do this. We need to jump right into discovery, start finding vulnerabilities, start mapping the network. Well, my argument is this, as an intern, I mean, as someone that has experience doing this stuff, if you're an internal team, you don't know everything. I, just about every single test that I do from an external perspective, I present the customer with a machine they have no idea was out fixed. Happens every single time, using the reconnaissance techniques we're going to talk about. From an external perspective, a lot of times you end up going back to this information anyway. You find a username harvesting vulnerability. What are you going to use if you don't have a list of usernames that you've already harvested somewhere else to attempt? Validate, right? So you're going to do this stuff anyway. And it's always, I mean, it's not just good to know. You have to know what the rest of the world knows either about you or about your target. That's your duty. So the solution is pretty easy to problem. And the solution is automation. In some cases, it's automating better. Because there are some tools out there that help you with, with automating reconnaissance. But some of them are one off tools. And some of them just aren't as good as they could be, right? So we're going to automate. And sometimes we're going to, in some places, we'll automate even better. So a black does information security, we've kind of taken this on. In our efforts over the past year, we've talked to DerbyCon about this, we've talked to HackerCon, multiple ISSA uh, gatherings, we've talked to SAN conferences all over the globe, not all over the globe, all over the country about reconnaissance, the importance of this as part of our methodology. We released some scripts uh, a year ago, like next week, was uh, we released Recon Engine, the script out of DerbyCon and a tool called Pushpin. And, we and I started to mention, I, I talked about building a framework. I wasn't real serious at the time, but I kind of talked about wanting to do something like that. But I really didn't think I had it in me. And then as things kind of continued on, and I started to, uh, to massage this idea of a framework, I started stumbling on some really, really cool stuff. And that's the fact that there are resources out there. There are third parties that are doing, that are executing all these other phases and the methodologies for us and making that information searchable and queryable for us through third party resources. Neat, neat things I came across as far as server-side enumeration goes. There's, there's websites out there that are constantly checking on your servers, looking at the server-side technologies, trying to enumerate what's running in the background, looking at your client-side stuff, making determinations on the technologies you're using, and you can query those resources. There's the Internet Census 2012. How many of you guys are familiar with the Internet Census that was done in 2012? Some guy had scanned the, scanned the Internet for a bunch of uh, embedded devices that had default threads, turned into a botnet to scan the entire IP version 4 space. All that data is queryable. You can download it, use it yourself, or query a third-party API and actually do port scans without ever touching the network. Okay. So you've got that kind of stuff you can, you can get you get your hands on. Vulnerability discovery, asafe web for .NET applications. You've got to click scan and see if there's any glaringly obvious vulnerabilities in .NET apps. XSS, Punk Spider, two resources that are sold that, that whose sole purpose is to report on, uh, on legitimate live exploits or vulnerabilities in websites. Okay. Now we're, we're getting into the discovery phase. Credential harvesting. There are companies out there who their entire business is, is based on going out, pulling down information from third parties, third party breach dumps, you know, like Stratfor and stuff like that, harvesting the users and passwords, information about the breaches, and then selling that data to people, including the clear text passwords. So we'll talk about how we can use that. And then there's contact scoping. We can take that a little bit further. Name check's actually a, a website you can go to, and you're supposed to put your username in it, and it will come back and say, well, here's all the places your username's not taken. Well, we can use that the other way, right? And if we're trying to find information about somebody, we know their username, we go there, we know the resources that we can go to to actually scope data on our particular part. So tons of really, really interesting resources, and it got me thinking, the process has changed. Right? We still have all this traditional stuff that we need to do, but now we can enumerate service site technology, start discovering vulnerabilities, harvesting credentials. We're digging deep into the methodology without sending a single packet or exploit to the target. So leveraging these resources has its caveats. Number one, we're using third-party websites, right? 
So we're, at some level, we're disclosing the fact that we are, are actually have a contract or some sort of connection with our target through that third party. So we could be in violation of non-disclosure agreements and contracts. At Blackfields Information Security, we have that built into our contracting process where we tell our client, hey, we want to do some really in-depth reconnaissance on you. Are you okay with us using these three party, third party resources? They sign off on it that they're okay with it. We've got to go ahead and do what we need to do. Don't do it without it because you can be violated if you're not a disclosure agreement. There's also active versus passive discovery. Passive discovery is, is a lot of times also referred to as reconnaissance. Right, we're not actually reaching out to the network. I mean, passive. I mean, uh, passive reconnaissance. Active reconnaissance is more discovery, where we're actually touching DNS, things of that sort, stuff where our pack executives refers to the target network. we we want to focus on passive reconnaissance when we talk about recon issues. And the last thing, not all data is free. So some of these resources that we use uh, cost money. Right, they've got APIs, and the APIs range anywhere from zero dollars to twenty-five thousand dollars. And these APIs can get very expensive, but the data is obviously ranges and it's useful. But the data is not free. Sometimes it costs a little bit of money. But in some cases, you'll see the money is worth it. So we got all these resources that we want to leverage. But it doesn't sound like it would take an incredible amount of time to actually go out to all of the websites and do the work that it would take to gather that information. But we got a tool to help us out, and it's the Recon ID. And it's the only one you're going to use. It's the only one you're going to use for a couple of reasons. Let's talk about exactly what it is and answer those questions. So, it's interactive, which means it's not a menu-driven UI. When it pops up and you see some numbers next to some, some uh, uh, module types, that's not a menu. You say, hey, click 63, it's going to show me all the recon modules. No, it's interactive, which means it's a lot like Metasploit. You type in help, there's different commands, you load modules, you set options, you run these modules. It's completely interactive. It's modular, which means that we've got a core framework with a bunch of functionality in it, and then you write modules, 10, 20, 30 lines of code to take advantage of all that built-in functionality to actually reach out to us for resources and parts of the data you're looking for. It's data-driven. Everything is stored in a database. Each module does one of two different things. It either stores data in a database, or it pulls data from the database, manipulates it, and writes back to it. So it's completely data-driven. It's scriptable. Those of you that have used set or Metasploit, you're familiar with resource scripts. It's simply a text file that has a list of commands in it, and you can run this resource script within the framework. Also, as of Black Hat 2013, I released Recon CLI, which is a command line interface for the framework, so that you no longer have to use resource scripts. You can use bash, you can use CMD, IDXE, whatever you want, bash files, to create scripts that you leverage Recon's modules. It's got the look and feel of Metasploit framework. Gotten some flack on this. They're like, well, why should you create something that looks just like Metasploit? Most of it, I wanted a short learning curve. I wanted those that have used Metasploit before to be able to pick this thing up and use it immediately. All, most of the commands are the same. The way it works is very, very familiar. If you've used Metasploit before, you can open the Recon Engine framework and know how to maneuver around it. It's documented out there on the wiki at the website, www.reconengine.com. Complete documentation on how to use the framework, how to interact with the UI, and how to develop modules for it with examples. It's developer friendly, but it goes with a wiki. And it's written in Python. That's probably the single most greatest thing about it, am I right? <laughs> yes, it's written in Python. And the other, and probably the second greatest thing about it, no third party library is required. How many people are sick and tired of installing third party software to use a tool? I know that I am. You don't have to do that if you're going to I have, in fact, that's the bane of my contributors' decisions. Because they'll want to contribute a module that uses some third party library, and I'll tell them to go figure out a way to do a data um, It makes them a better developer, it makes the framework more lightweight. And in most cases, all those third party libs are written in native Python, so you can figure out a way to do it yourself. And usually, usually they're able to find a way to do it. And there's the website where you can get it. So one of my key, one of my key design goals for this was not to overlap with other frameworks. This is not a replacement. This doesn't do what Set does. It doesn't do what Metasploit does. It's not designed to overlap with those. It's designed to fit into the methodology with those. So you can easily take the output for Recon NG, use it with the social engineering toolkit, use it as input to different Metasploit modules. It fits into the methodology. It doesn't overlap, and it doesn't replace any of your existing frameworks. It has its niche in the market, so to speak. Okay, so I'm not going to go. In, I'm not going to actually get in the UI and show you all the different things it does because there are videos <coughs> out there that do that. But I want to explain some UI highlights. Uh, cover some UI highlights real quick. First, there's command and completion everywhere. If the framework can anticipate a value you want to give it, hit tab, it'll complete it for you. Smart loading. 
module names can be like 60 characters long and it's typically a path, right, to the module. If the module path has a unique name in it, like pwn list or something like that, you type in load pwn and it's going to load that module. So there's no need to type in these long module names or even use tab config to get through them. That's something I certainly wish Redis would implement because it would make things so much easier. Module switching, you can load modules from other modules. It's a new feature that wasn't there before. Direct data access, you can query the database, the underlying database directly from the framework. You don't have to go through current modules to do that. It's built under the concept of workspaces. So you can work with multiple clients, multiple targets at the same time, right, without your data intermixing or overlapping. You have separate sets of settings for each one as well. And it's also got various verbosity and debugging uh, options so that if you're having issues with a particular module and you need to send me a bug report, you can just turn the bugging on, run it, copy, paste, and we'll be on our way. So one of the, one of the probably most common questions I get about this, other than, you know, how do I use the framework to say to RTFM on the wiki? One of the most common questions I get is, how do you use the framework? How does it, like, where do you, how does it fit in your methodology? What, how do you step through the process of using it? What are your favorite modules? So that's what I basically saw. From this point on forward, I'm going to walk you through how I would use it on a penetration test. I won't run every module, but I'll at least show you every module that I use. So if you want the Tim Tone certified route to using Raytheon IMG, you're going to see it. Okay. The first thing I do is I do contact harvesting, and I do think these three these three actions: information gathering, data manipulation, and contact scoping. So for information gathering, I, we've got a couple different options that I think are are the best for doing this. Number one is LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is social networking for professionals, right? How many people have a LinkedIn account? Did any of you guys use a nickname on your LinkedIn account? Nobody uses a nickname on the LinkedIn account, do they? We use our real names. That's why we like LinkedIn over stuff like Facebook, Twitter, and things like that. People put real information on there. You know, sometimes they may, they may say they work for somebody that they don't, um, things of that sort. But for the most part, the data we put on LinkedIn is real because we want to connect with other professionals. And those professionals are going to validate that information about us. So we like LinkedIn as a resource for gathering information about contacts. The single probably greatest resource for doing this is Jigsaw. How many people are familiar with Jigsaw? So Jigsaw is formerly a customer relationship management software. It was bought out by Salesforce in 2010 for I think like $150 million. But basically it's a repository of contacts. Okay? Now Jigsaw has kind of a, a, an interesting business, business concept. It is crowdsourced, meaning that um, people that want contacts if I collect business cards, I can go to Jigsaw and say, hey, Jigsaw, here's a bunch of information about people. And Jigsaw, for every, every single card, every single piece of contact information they can validate, will give you access to then go download a contact they currently have in their database. All right? What do they consider a contact? You got to have phone number, email, address, full name, email address. And they will call that person, email that person, and validate the information. Who you got to call from Jigsaw before? I have. I rarely get hands up, but I've gotten a call from Jigsaw where they were trying to validate my information. You say, eh, eh. They don't they actually put it in the database, and then that person doesn't get credit for it. But it's crowdsourced in that way. It's also crowdsourced in the effect that they've got this kind of like achievement thing going on where you can go, like they have this month's the top contributors of contacts, and the top three get paid, right? So if you're contributing contacts, most of you contribute the most in a month, you get like a check for 300 bucks. Right? And you get some sort of like fake metal achievement or something like that. <laughs> so they got a kind of a brilliant concept in how they do this, but the information that the, the way they entice salesmen to come buy this stuff, you can also just purchase access and stuff without well, getting to it. The way they entice you is you can go there and you can search and you can get back first names, last names, and job titles and the location of where they're at for every single person in the database. Didn't that sound like some information we would want during contact harvesting? First name, last name. And job title, I can essentially create email addresses and know where you work and what you do for any person I can harvest for your organization. So the information we want is free, okay? And we can go and we can scrape that from the web, or we can use their API. The API costs 250 bucks a year, but it's a heck of a lot faster. There's no rate limiting, and we've got this cat and, cat and mouse game going on with Jigsaw right now, where every time I break their their like their mechanism for stopping me from scraping their website, they do something else, and then I break it again, and do something else. And break it again. The funny thing is that I know the developer is there, and we've talked about doing work together to fix this thing right. But right now, it works until they break it again. But API is better because it's faster, there's no rate limiting, and as you're going to see, you can pull down a thousand contacts in just a few seconds. The other place we can get information about folks is PGP key servers. How many people have PGP keys? You host it on server? 
Most people have them out on a server, like my company mandates that we put them on a public server so our customers can go get them. Well, all you have to go is to the MIT PGP key search engine, just search for the domain, and you'll see all the email addresses of all the people that have PGP keys on that domain. Pretty awesome stuff. So we've got a lot of places that we can go gather information about people. So the two modules I use are Jigsaw and LinkedIn all. And let's go ahead and demo the Jigsaw module. So who thinks the FBI is a good target? <laughs> okay, we're gonna use, we're, we're gonna we're gonna target the FBI. Anybody here the FBI? You're not gonna raise your hand. You're just a fun target to pick on, considering you just released all that information about. What are they? What are they doing? Tapping, tapping something, get quite some information about people. They're all the same. So here's Recon Engine. Can you guys see that? Okay. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. That's what it was. That was actually a no call. All right, so I get it. But you know, whatever, privacy violations. So this is Recon Engine. This is what it looks like when you log in. So do not type 63 thinking you're going to see, because then you're going to get something like this. You're going to get some random message that mocks you. All right. <laughs> so, so there's all kinds of silly messages in there. Enjoy. That's kind of an Easter egg I put in there because I had some, I had some guys that are like fairly prominent community. They're like, dude, I'm typing 63, and all I'm getting is just, it's like there's no command. So what's the deal with your framework? Is it everything that's at all? Question mark? Maybe. You know? Does that look like it's in chronological order? Don't you think recon modules would be like one? <laughs> so, but anyway, so uh, this is a poke fun of some buddies. But, but yeah, so it's interactive. You type help, you see everything. I'm not going to go through all these, but I'm going to go straight through the Jigsaw module. Actually, we can't do that yet. Show options. In our global options, we need to set our company and domain. We said FBI, right? So let's set the company to Federal Bureau of Investigation. Did I spell that right? I want to go with yes. <laughs> you can't see that. That's not a good thing. Very often. Let me let me let me get a, a full screen and, and then we'll try to do it this way. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of ripped a little bit. It's still cut off, but we'll we'll figure it out. There we go. Okay. So federal investigation investigation sets domain uh, FBI.gov. I'm pretty sure. And now let's load <coughs> Jigsaw. Smart loading says, oh wait a second, we got more than one module with Jigsaw on it. So this is the smart loading I was telling you about. But if I type in load search contacts, then it will find a unique string and load that module. Pretty cool, right? Most of your most of your global um, global options are going to be imported into the modules that use them. So you don't have to do a whole lot of module level configuration in most cases. But once we have it, we just set it. We click run. We go, and Jigsaw is going to go out and it's going to say, "Hey, I found information about about these companies." Right? So it's got a couple of different companies that reported in federal <coughs> investigation. The one we want is probably this one. Okay. So let's go ahead and pull down this information. Hit enter because the top one's always the default, and it's only the class for like crap. Man. Okay. <laughs> you might see some stuff in here that, you know, like this slope disclaimer here. If you see something that offends you, I'm sorry, I can't help you give yourself a password dump. We do the password dump here in a little while. Um, you're going to see some stuff in there because I saw some stuff in there. But um, I don't condone the use of passwords with those words in them. Just know that. I okay, so. So we still show contacts here. We get a nice view of the database. It looks it looks bad right now because all the columns are being smushed with all the data in there. But if you zoom out, like, yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> I guess it's moving straight around. But if you zoom out, then you'll see it all data all nice and pretty. Show dashboard. This is kind of a neat command. I actually give you kind of a summary of what you got going on right now. We see that we got 1,029 contacts in there. But we've only got first name, last name, and uh, job title and location. Okay, so we're missing, we still don't have the information we really want, which is usernames and email addresses, and we'll get to that now. Christy, what do we have? We've got these top four items here, but what we really <coughs> want is email addresses and usernames. So we've got to build our contacts, and the first thing we have to do is get the email domain. Now, if we already know the domain, we probably already know what the email domain is, right? But we need to validate that information. Uh, we can do that using MX records. We can do that looking at who's in, who is contacts. But probably the most important thing is trying to find out what the naming conventions for the email addresses are. First name, dot last name, first initial, dot last name, first initial, dot last name. We've got to figure out what that naming convention is. And there's a couple ways we can do that. We can go to their websites. 
try to find the publicly exposed email address and then get the naming convention from there. We can use, we can look at who is contacts because those are normally associated with, uh, with the target organization, uh, someone within the organization. We can also go back to that PGP key search again. We can use a search engine. Now most search engines don't let you search for the at sign. Google will then cut that out with the spammers who are exploiting that. However, Baidu, which is the Chinese search engine, the Chinese Google, actually lets you search by that character still. So you can go to Baidu, search for that right there, and in many cases you'll get legitimate email address hits. So that's a place we can go get trial and error. You just guess. Or we can use the Jigsaw API. So another, another benefit of having that Jigsaw API key is you get access to 350 full contacts, which includes their email addresses and everything. You go, you use one of those photo to pull down an actual contact from Jigsaw, and you have their email address, which you can pull the name from. And then once we have that information, we can create email addresses by mangling the first and last name that we already have, appending it to the domain and creating email addresses. And we'll have a pretty good product. So let's look at some of those modules. The first one here we're going to look at is the who is POCs. Once again, not much to fill out here. So it goes through and starts pulling out the POCs. All right, we can go back and look at these, and you can kind of see that the first name dot last name here, first name dot last name again. That looks like the first initial last name. So. It looks like it may, it, there's some different naming schemes in there, but we're starting to get an idea of what that looks like, and in the process, we've harvested 20 new contacts. We was able to determine that 20 of these 21 contacts that were shown actually belong to that domain and are not already in the database. So that's kind of nice. So we've got some information to work with. The next one we want to leverage is the PTP search stuff. So let's go over here and look for the, let's look at that. Oh, I guess it's over there. Smart load works for me. Run this one, it's kind of going to do the same thing. It's going to go out and it's going to use PGP search, search, uh, searching engines. <laughs> right? And so you see some things here, right? This looks like first name, last name, <laughs> last name, first initial last name, right? Well, we're kind of all over the map here. To tell you the truth, I don't know what the heck I would put the convention here. I would probably end up going out and purchasing one of the uh, legitimate contact. What's really going on here? <laughs> Field offices may have, maybe you can show up your own email servers, possibly use different naming conventions. So you've got some, you've got some with the FBI.gov, you're going to have some issues there. But with a normal corporation, you're pretty much going to have a solid naming convention. But these are some ways that we can go get some of that information. And then when we, we see that we got, let's see, query, select, first name. Oof, boy, I'm bad at typing like this. If you, ever, if you don't know what the schema looks like, just type show schema and you can look at it. Um, just have name and name. Yeah, that, that schema thing comes in handy. All right, and then we can see here, we've got some first names and last names. We want to turn these things into email addresses. So we go to here and we, we load this command called main or a module called main goal. Let's do an info on this and I'll show you what info looks like. That gives you a lot more information about the module. You get you get kind of a uh, some just some metadata about it. You see the options, you see a description. But what I want you to take a look at is just pattern options on the bottom. So one of the options for this is you have to you have to set the pattern. What is the pattern? First name, last name, first name, dot last name, whatever it is. You set the pattern, you run it, it pulls all the context out of the database that doesn't already have an email address set, creates an email address for the type of database for us. So let's go ahead and run this. First thing about last thing, we'll go with that. We'll just say that that's it. So we run it. Bam, we got that information all stored in the database. So now we've pretty much got our contacts table filled out. Right? We've got first names, last names, email addresses, job titles, and where they're located. So pretty good, a pretty good starting point for RFC contact, right? We need usernames. We've got a place to go to get usernames. So for social engineering, we've got email addresses to send to. And now we can also validate our targets by looking at where they're located. If we're, if we're going against the, the main office in the Washington, D.C. area, well, let's look at the geographic location. If it's in D.C. area, then we know we're going after somebody that's probably a legitimate target. Obviously, we want to confirm a lot of this stuff with our, with our customer, but we're building the information set at this point. So what do I do next? Quick question. Uh, sure. From a blue team perspective, you 
you think it would be worth uh, just chapping out a few thousand bogus PGB keys just to confuse guys like you? Um, all I'm going to get is, an, is, is a message back from your SMTP server telling me that the account doesn't exist, and I'm still going to fish everybody that I do find, right? So, I mean, yeah, you could, right? I mean, in a case like FBI, I, I usually never will get to NSA, but I'd like not to do that today. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of crackback, right? Like the, like the FBI one. I didn't sound legitimate FBI account, so you got to kind of sift through the garbage sometimes. Um, it just makes for a fun presentation. But, but yeah, you could. You could do that. But is it is the time or is it a, you know, it's called benefit analysis, I guess you got to conduct on it? Yeah. I'm thinking like honeypots start looking for people who are actually, you know, trying to hook to those addresses that exist nowhere but these PGP keys that you've thrown out there. Yeah. Like, you know, that's an attacker probing you at that point. Yeah. It could be. Absolutely could be. If they guess, if they guess a username that you put out somewhere else at the, on your web application and you know that that's something out there. Hacker. Yeah, that's it. There are definitely some blue team uses for the framework. Don't get me wrong. Well, the only problem with that is that you're going to find that there's a darn many people doing it. You could get a thousand a day. It's not going really, to be too hard to get the signal from the bullets. Okay. Just to take it off right there. I don't know we're out of time. I'm going to keep going. Next thing I want to do is contact scoping here. Uh, we, this is the part where we're actually trying to get information about the people that we harvested. We got the usual suspects here, social networks, search engines, code repositories, and we have the actual name check module that, we, that I spoke about briefly earlier. So once I've done harvesting contacts, I'm going to move on to harvesting posts. We're going to do this for a couple of reasons. We want to validate our scope. We want to do some server-side enumeration. If we've got anti-port scanning measures that we're dealing with, well, we want to try to get some sort of port scan data. And we also want to try to do some vulnerability discovery, all without sending any packets or exploits to the target. So for scope validation, we've got some options. We can use Whois. That's kind of one of the go-to tools for that. AdSense and Google AdSense and Google Analytics lookups. If there's a if there's an analytics or, or AdSense ID within the page, pull it, go to a place like e who is, and look and see if there's any other pages that are actually using that ID because they're possibly done by the same developer, which means that it could have the, you could have some uh, some sites there that should be in scope. Search engine site directive. How many people are familiar with the site directive? You go to a search engine like Google and you say site colon sans.org, you're going to get all the sites sans.org. And on the front page you notice there's a w, a www dot, maybe a forensics dot, or an isc dot sans.org. Go back up to the search engine, type in minus site colon www dot sans.org minus site colon isc.sans.org. The next list of results is going to be domains that aren't those. You keep doing that so you have no responses, and what do you have? You've got a search engine-based zone file transfer almost, right? For everything that's internet aware. How many concepts? So we, we can do that. Uh, we can do some DNS brute forcing. This is more along the lines of, remember now we're going through the Alpha-Rotated DNS server, so it's more active reconnaissance. IP neighbor lookups, once we have an IP address for a server, we can see what other domains are hosted on that same server, and then we can geolocate by IP address. Let's look at some of these. So let's load <coughs> web Google site. So now I'm going to use IP, load IP neighbor. So this IP neighbor one does it by domain instead of IP address. Let's do this one here. It's going to come back and say we're finding all kinds of stuff co-located. 51 new hosts that are co-located. <coughs> so we're harvesting using all those modules you saw that were white on the, on the demo slide instead of yellow. We're going to find a ton of hosts for FBI.gov. The final thing we want to do is, I mean, it's not final thing, but once we're starting to collect these posts, well, we want to start to fill out this table. We want IP addresses. We want geolocation information. So let's load, uh, first of all. And we're going to do this against Google's. Run it. And it's going to give us the IP address for all of those. And from here on out, we can go, we can do, we can do Bing IP, to do the IP reversing and finding out what <coughs> are the same IPs. We 
going to load the IP info DB module, run it, and it's going to go and pull down geolocation for every IP that it found. And we'll see very, very quickly. Hold on, hurry up. Time is of the essence. All right, so show hosts. You see that we got a lot of information about these hosts now. So we've definitely got enough information to do some scope validation here. And we've also got some targets, some possible targets that are uh, um, that are hosted by our by our actual client. Okay, so let's move on with what we're doing with these hosts. So now that we've harvested them as part of our traditional reconnaissance, let's move on to some of the advanced stuff. We've got server-side enumeration. To do server-side enumeration, typically we've got to do some sort of response header analysis, looking at server headers and cookie names. We look at different error responses by giving, by giving, by making requests that we know don't work and analyzing those responses. We can analyze all of that data through, brow through uh, browsers and interception proxies, right? We can do an NAP scan, but all this stuff is making direct contact. All this stuff is reaching out and touching the servers. We don't want to do that, so we're going to use these other, these other resources. It's built with what web and the 2012 internet census. But once we've enumerated, we want to move on to vulnerability discovery. And typically, and typically once we know something about the network, even if we're doing a network pen testing, we're not we're beyond reconnaissance at this point. Once we know what services are running, we know the versions and things like that, we go and we do research, right? We do research, we look at the CVEs, we try to find out are there any vulnerabilities associated with this version. This enumeration plus research kind of gives us a hint as to what discovery or what vulnerabilities are out there. Now obviously if we're doing this during the reconnaissance process, if we're doing re research based on what we've enumerated using these third party resources, we can't do any validation. Validation is reaching out and touching the target. We're not doing that yet. And uh, rather, than, rather than doing manual research, we can do things like using asafer web, XSS, Punk Spider. Who is familiar with Punk Spider? Released this Shmoocon. Basically they got a scanning engine that's scanning the entire .com space for, uh, for web vulnerabilities, SQL injection, blind SQL injection, cross script. Whether it's legal, uh, I don't know. It's not up to me to decide. But that information's out there for you to query. It's a pretty cool stuff. I'm running low on time, so I'm not gonna demo either of those. Uh, but please, go out and take a look at those modules. It's pretty awesome, because this one is kind of the, the Mac heavy of them all. Credential harvesting. Once we've harvested hosts, we've harvested contacts, the next thing we want to do is try to go find out if we can find any passwords for the users that we've enumerated. Right, there's a couple places we can do that. Should I change my password.com? It's very similar to the public list in that they mine that data. They're mining those public, those publicly breached credentials and making them searchable. Should I change my password does not provide password information. They just validate your username. Homelist.com will provide the password if you're willing to pay for a $25,000 API key. All right. I happen to have access to one, so I'm going to get to show you what this looks like in real time. Right. So what's the problem with some of this? Some of those breaches, security folks are doing it right, and, they're only, and they're only, uh, they're only, their passwords are stored in hash format. So we've got hashes that we have to deal with. Sometimes they're softened, there's not a whole lot we can do about that. Sometimes they're not, and we can use these three resources right here to actually look up hashes and hash tables. Okay. And try to reverse those, so to speak. We know hashes aren't reversible, but we can look them up to see if they've been solved at one time before. So let's take a look at that. Really quickly. Load home list. Now normally I would go and I would use the web, the web slash home list module first. That uses the web front end and it violates the terms of service by scraping the data as soon as the username scrapes the response. I prefer to use the API, but before I really do anything, I want I would like to know if this domain's ever been breached before before I waste a bunch of time doing some enumeration. So I load with the is pwned module and I run that against FBI.gov. And it says, yes, there's been 179 cloned accounts, and the latest one was like a couple days ago. <laughs> Which is meaningful to us, right? Because those could be legit creds still today, even with the 30-day password change. <laughs> so we're very interested in this. Sometimes it's like it was two years ago. I'm not worried about the creds. And the reason why, the reason why this date matters is because the next module we're going to use is domain creds. And when I go to dump all the credentials, it says, hey, this is going to cost you 10,000 queries. And when you're paying $25,000 for an API key and you only get 4 million queries a year, 10,000 queries is a lot. So you've got to determine whether this information is that meaningful to you because it's like $65 a time to run this. Right? 65 bucks a pop if you run this fucker. But we're going to run it. <laughs> and we're going to harvest 179 
pretensions, okay? So we go here, we show threads, and we've got some stuff in here. Let's query username, password from threads. This one. in there too though as you can see well you can't see them in here but if I if you do show threads there's a whole other column for hashes that aren't solved. So let's load leak db and let's run it. And it's gonna go through and it's gonna start reversing this thing. Geez crap more I wonder where that one came from. <laughs> and sometimes it doesn't do very well, right? Like these right here, it's not cracking a whole lot of these. But then it's gonna hit some fun ones here in a moment. <laughs> Anyone ever heard of TTP in video game programming before? Look it up, I'm not going to talk about it. That's a great, that's a real strong password, isn't it? Right, so now I've cracked some additional passwords. And I've probably got about 179 accounts, probably got somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60, 60 that actually have those like passwords for. I can, we've walked into assessments twice in the past year since we've been doing this. We've walked into penetration tests and logged into a VPN the instant we got, we got the green flag to go. Okay. Credit just works. Doesn't always happen, but sometimes it does. To us, if you can get a discount on the key, if you can somehow work out another deal with them, it may be worth the money to have this because you can walk into a pen test with credentials already and there is, there is no replacement for something like that. That value is incredible. Well, I should say the value is probably what you're making on a pen test, right? <laughs> so we're doing all of this with absolutely no exploits. We've not sent a single packet to the target network. And what have we done? We've harvested all kinds of contact information. We've harvested all kinds of hosts. And we possibly got credentials to the environment without ever sending a single packet to the client. Hell, we don't even have to have a, uh, a signed contract at this point. We've not even touched the target. We're merely querying third party resources. Right? That's the power of reconnaissance at this point. So additional things we can do is physical reconnaissance. Anybody here heard of Pushkin before? Pushman was a tool that was originally written a couple of years ago uh, as a comp proof of concept. Uh, I did some additional work on it and released it at DerbyCon last year, and then I stopped messing with it because I started playing with this. It got broken, and I decided I'm going to integrate it into Recon NG. Okay. So as of Black Hat 2013 this year, I integrated Pushman in with, in with uh, Recon NG. For those of you who don't know what Pushman is, it's a geotag media aggregator. So every time you tweet, Every time you take a picture on your phone, you upload it to Flickr for Casa, or you take a video and you upload it to YouTube. If you have your phone settings in the default, um, in the default settings for geolocation, it is most likely tagging that with your location and uploading it and making it searchable by me and anybody else that's using Pushman. So what we do is we go out and we say, here's a latitude, here's a longitude, here's a radius. Give me all forms of media from these five different resources that are within that radius. Then it plots them on a map and gives you a listing of all the data. Okay. Cool thing about the uh, the improvements that have come from implementing it with Recon NG is that I fixed a whole bunch of bugs that that, that accumulated over the time that I was ignoring the project. Um, now the data is stored in a database. So if you run if you can run it every five minutes for the next two days, and all of the data for the two days that you've been running it will be there and no overlap. So you can have a continuous resource of data rather than just giving one snapshot at one point in time, which is actually a really, really big improvement. And it's also extensible since it's now built into the modularity of Recon NG. You can easily create a new media, media module to get this information from. And there's actually almost kind of a, a standard or API for how to actually build the data that goes in. Beyond reconnaissance, the, if you notice there are discovery models and exploitation models built into the framework. From the discovery perspective, you can query for exploitable pages. These are known vulnerabilities in web, app, in web apps. DNS cache poisoning for A-B detection. This is something that Rob Dixon through a four deep was working on. You actually just you do a, uh, a non-recursive <coughs> query on their ex, uh, outward-facing DNS server for the known domains that A-B uses to update, and whichever ones make a hit, then you know that that's what you're using for A-B. You search for backup files, interesting files, things like robot dump text, stuff like that. So some pretty neat discovery modules. And then something I've started working on recently is exploitation. 
I did a video about two weeks ago where I built a blind XPath injection brute forcer that actually enumerates the entire server-side XML data source and presents it to you in real time. Um, so I'm starting to get to the point now where I've got this framework, I'm doing a lot of web app stuff, I don't want to write a one-off tool when I have all the sources built into it, so it's growing, it's getting beyond reconnaissance. If you've got ideas for how to use the framework, please reach out, let's continue to expand this tool because I think it can be useful for more than just reconnaissance, even though that was, this, that was its initial inception. And that's Recon NG in about 45 minutes. I could talk about this for two or three days, right? There's a lot to it. Um, there's like 70 something modules, we covered like six of them. Um, here's your website, it's Recon NG. For the, for the tool, Landmaster 53 for me. If you want more free tools and you want, if you want to get a notice when I'm doing a webcast or something like that, uh, I do quite a few of them for Sands and for Black Hills. Please leave me your business card or come write your name on something. Um, also, uh, if you're interested in learning how to hack web applications, I'm going to be teaching at Sands, Sands Security East down in New Orleans, which is an awesome spot, right, to go to a class in January. So please, I'd love you to join me. I'd love you to some cool things. Other than that, that's it. Thank you for the reunion. What's that? Oh, hey, trivia question. Um, Anybody want to try to guess where my handle came from? You're, I saw your hand first. I was a functionary 53 officer in the Army. You're absolutely right. And it's followed me around ever since. Do you want anybody here that's in the 250 Sierra program? Oh, cheater! Oh, cheater! Thank you very much.